Bienvenue. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the 75th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Tech Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technology Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. I'm so excited to welcome you all. We have more upcoming events this semester. So the next events are Dr. Hannah Zeven and Dr. Marika C4 will be speaking, um, one in February and one in March. So keep checking back on our website or follow us on Eventbrite, Facebook, or Twitter for more updates. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. So that's the redirect URL, disruptingdisruptions.com. The other URL is just way too long to remember. <laughs> you can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Mila, Rakaf, and more. I want to particular particularly thank Concordia University's Applied AI Institute and McGill University's Philosophy Department, Stephen A. Jaroslawski, Chair in Human Nature and Technology for providing funding for today's event. So for today, we have a Q&A option available. So throughout the event, you may type your questions in the Q&A answer box below, and there will be some time during the second part of the event for Dr. Ababa Berhani to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful for the discussion that you generate. Thank you to our captioner for today, Sarah. As we welcome you into our homes and our offices through Zoom and you welcome us into yours, let us be mindful of space and place. As many of you know, past series speakers, Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While many of the events this semester are virtual or hybrid, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our virtual events are on as well. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. The series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. McGill is located in Jijoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the organizing efforts by Indigenous communities, water protectors, and people involved in land back movements make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space, and inform the conversations we have today. I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on. Nativeland.ca is a fantastic resource for beginning. Now for today's event. Dr. Ababa Barhani is a cognitive scientist researching human behavior, social systems, and responsible and ethical artificial intelligence, AI. Her interdisciplinary research explores various broad themes in embodied cognitive science, machine learning, complexity science, and theories of decoloniality. Her work includes audits of computational models and large-scale data sets. Barhani is a senior fellow in Trustworthy AI at the Mozilla Foundation and an adjunct assistant professor at the School of Computer Science and Statistics at Trinity College Dublin. I'll also add that we're just so excited to have you all for today's event. It's our 75th event, and it's been so wonderful to share all of these amazing speakers with you. And I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Ababa Barhani today. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for such a generous introduction and thank you for inviting me. I'm also very excited to be here. Uh, I will go ahead and share my slides. Uh, you see my slides okay? Yeah, we do. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, as you said in the introduction, uh, I work, I'm a cognitive scientist by training, uh, and I work at the intersection of COGSI, um, you know, criticizing or critical machine learning, critical AI, 
uh, data auditing, and also uh, I uh, flirt with, you know, the colonial theories or the the colonial approaches to ethics, to machine learning, and so on. Um, And I don't often talk about my work around the coloniality, uh, and I think a lot of my time, a lot of my space is taken up by kind of trying to uh, engaging in this rat race around, you know, what's the latest scandal in machine learning. So today I'm happy to talk about uh, uh, my work around decoloniality. And um, this is, um, I, I will aim to talk for about uh, 40 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, and if you have, if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat, and I'm happy to answer them uh, uh, during uh, during my presentation. Uh, I'm also happy to just finish the presentation and then engage in the Q and A. Um, so today I will talk about machine learning and decoloniality, and this is uh, th- this talk comes from two working papers ongoing papers uh and um it's yeah it's taken from uh from 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 both papers both forthcoming papers one is um you know one is exploring whether uh, the idea of decoloniality is compatible at all with machine learning or not uh, and the other work is um looking at internet infrastructure uh, under sea cables uh, in the in the uh, in the in the context of africa in the african context uh, and um, so i will bring in bits and pieces from this work and i will talk about them so Decolonization has become a, a buzzword. You, we hear about, uh, you know, uh, decolonizing education, uh, decolonizing technology, decolonizing machine learning, decolonizing the internet. Uh, it's uh, especially over the past maybe ten years, it has become a thing to decolonize things, and and it comes from a, a, a genuine concern. Uh, because we see we see so much uh, so many concerns and so many issues uh, so the 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 idea or the aspiration to decolonize this or to decolonize that comes from the desire to get at the heart of the problem and to look at things from a fresh perspective from a different perspective so most of the time uh, this approach is founded or uh, called for. Uh, however, uh, as uh, uh, as the scholar uh, Pablo Chuque warns, there is also a danger that the, you know, the term decolonization just becomes a buzzword and uh, it, then it just, it does, it, it ends up doing nothing, no substa- it, it ends up bringing no substantial change, no substantial uh, consequences so uh, we do support the idea of decolonization but with a bit of a little bit of grain of salt and with cautious interrogation of what we mean by decolonization so this can machine learning be decolonized Uh, this is the question we explore as i said in the paper with uh, the uh, Zirak Talat, my collaborator, uh, he is a linguist and a computational linguist and a machine learning researcher. Some of you m- uh, might might know him. Um, so what do we mean by machine learning before we get into decolonization? What do we mean by machine learning? So machine learning, uh, machine learning modeling, at least, of phenomena come, it's uh, these days, you know, uh, we build machine learning models for everything. So the first thing we, uh, it, the first thing that's really important to do to kind of get into or to clarify is uh, we we can think of we we can taxonomize machine learning modeling of 
you know, various phenomena into three broad categories. One of them is a very narrow use of machine learning to model, say, uh, very clearly defined systems such as physical systems or uh, even uh, things like um, now casting, which is forecasting the weather for a short amount of time for the next two or three hours. So this kind of machine learning or or building machine learning models for to for um, board games such as chess or go. Uh, these are relatively simple systems that uh, that our criticism doesn't really delve into. Uh, and the second category is somewhat messy. And the third category is machine uh, building machine learning tools uh, to to sort, to categorize, or to to find patterns, or to or to or, or making or building predictive systems that are around the social uh, uh, social affairs. It could be. Um, it could be categorizing social systems. It could be, for example, uh, machine learning models used around law enforcement, for example, to, to predict um, recidivism uh, or machine learning models used to uh, determine uh, you know, immigration status or to manage uh, migrants, things like that. So these, we think, uh, squarely belong in the social domain. And our criticism of machine learning is that that sort of models, those those kind of machine learning models. So those models in uh, in our argument uh, are uh, really problematic. And what machine learning does uh, basically is uh, really finding patterns, uncovering patterns from a huge, from a vast amount of data. Uh, and uh, also at the heart of machine learning is looking at what has been, uh, you know, what, what has happened in the past or what the patterns are in the past and future making or future predicting based on what has hap happened in the past. Um, so in the process, what we do is we, we uh, you know, gather huge volumes of data uh, we simplify these social phenomena. We kind of reduce them to basic caricatures, uh, and uh, and and we make predictive models. So we delve also into the roots of machine learning, which are uh, which which are based in in statistics. Uh, and uh, there is plenty of robust body of work showing that, um, you know, the very conception of statistics comes from, you know, white supremacy, from eugenics objectives and backgrounds. Um, so, yeah, the, the, these kind of statistical tools were created in the first place to... Uh, uh, to kind of sort out or to classify or to um, to categorize, for example, racial hierarchies or class hierarchies, which which were then used to justify, you know, slavery, to justify colonialism, to even justify uh, uh, Nazi genocide. So machine learning comes with this baggage, with this problematic historical baggage, and. Um, Again, another characteristics, another characteristics of machine learning is um, there, there is really no understanding. It really is just, you know, pattern finding and then making prediction based on that pattern without any understanding, without any attempt to understanding why we are finding the patterns that we are finding. Um, and um, and another issue that's at the core of machine learning is also the field is uh, uh, kind of dictated by a handful of uh, mainly Western, you know, European white cisgendered males, uh, and and you know, no model building emerges from you know from a, a historical or cultural or contextual background. 
Um, so any any model building or or any metrics or any assessment or even the kind of questions we are asking cannot be separated from our own backgrounds. And as a field that is really driven and dominated by this homogeneous group, um, a lot of what machine learning ends up investigating, what you know, what the field ends up being interested in, and what the field ends up, uh, you know, deciding is important, uh, is inseparable from the interests of those, uh, you know. Uh, homogeneous handful individuals in groups. And let's move on to the next slide. Apologies. And um, again, another dimension of machine learning is um, the very social infrastructure of you know the field you can even call it you can even think of it as as an industry as a complex is driven by capitalist uh, objectives for example uh, most machine learning with, uh, whether it's research or application or whether it's big corporations or startups uh, there is a huge drive for uh for there is a it's usually treated as a business uh, as as a profit maximization and um and and, and much of the field uh really uh leans on exploitation whether it is uh data theft this is a term i recently came across and i really like it uh because uh Machine learning itself, the techniques that are currently uh, being used are really not new. These um, the core techniques that have uh, that that have been around since the 60s, 70s. Um, it's the availability. I say with a quotation mark. It's the availability of uh, uh, huge, vast amounts of data that has made machine learning all of a sudden a boom. Uh, and this. Uh, uh, and this boom emerged over the last, uh, when was ImageNet? Uh, the, over the last 15 years, uh, because the internet made it possible uh, to gather huge amounts of data. So a lot of even the data that are, that's the backbone of machine learning uh, comes from people, comes from, you know, the images that we put, we post online, or the you know our textual exchange that are then kind of uh, gathered and used as 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 uh, uh, as essential ingredients for machine learning. Uh, on top of that, uh, data labeling is a really problematic practice, where uh, usually underpaid and under uh, overexploited workers from the global uh, south often are uh, uh, have to pay the heaviest price. Uh, so these are some of the issues that uh, that underlie machine learning that are the core uh, that are at the core of machine learning that I will come back to in a, in a bit. So speaking of um, hold on, let me just turn my light on. I apologize because it's getting dark here. Now you can see me better. So, as I said, a handful of you know bodies, individuals, and corporations uh, really have monopolized uh, the the machine learning space. Uh, this is from a paper myself and my colleagues did uh, published last year, where we looked at um, 100 most influential papers. Uh, in machine learning from two of the most uh, influential, the most pre prestigious co conferences, the most prestigious venues, which are uh, NeurIPSI and ICML. And we compared uh, the corporate affiliations and funding ties of those papers uh, over, over the 10 years time. And as you can see here uh, on the left is uh, in 2008 and 2009, um, about 77% of the most influential papers in machine learning 
had no corporate affiliations. So that means these papers came from various institutions, various universities or research centers. Uh, and big tech only uh, papers with big big tech corporations. These are you know corporations such as Microsoft, Google, DeepMind, Facebook, and so on. Um, only eleven percent of those came from big big uh, were affiliated with big tech corporations. Uh, and then we looked at the same thing uh, ten years later, and in two thousand and eighteen and two thousand and nineteen, as you can see on the right that the numbers have drastically changed. So uh, 10 years before, most of the papers were published by various multidisciplinary uh, uh, and multiple um, uh, uh, authors, whereas 10 years later, most of the most influential papers, 58% of them to be precise, were uh, published by uh, people or authors that have big corporate affiliations. So this is just to show that uh, the field is becoming a, a monopoly where a few corporations are uh, really deciding the next steps. And it's the same, this is, uh, sorry, I should have explained prior to this. Uh, this comes from the other work that I've been doing with a uh, um, a mentee and a collaborator, Esther Muema, where we've been looking at uh, internet infrastructure uh, around Africa. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, it's not just machine learning research, uh, infer internet infrastructure is also very heavily dominated and controlled by uh, big tech corporations. And as you can see here, the top um, um, five undersea cable providers are um, corporations such as uh, Two Africa is by Facebook, uh, Equiano uh, is by Google, and the rest of them are by Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and so on. So as we can see here, it's not machine learning. It's also the, the internet infrastructure, at least definitely in, in Africa, that has been dominated and monopolized by handful few uh, big corporations that are working uh, from a capitalist aim or through a for a capitalist tribe uh, which is uh, really maximizing profits and um unfortunately uh decolonization has also been used uh to uh unironically <laughs> this is uh it should be ironic unironically to to co-opt and uh, to appropriate, uh, you know, African languages, African conceptions, for example, Ubuntu, uh, a South African philosophy that has been around for thousands of years. Uh, now, if you ask most people what Ubuntu is, they will tell they will think of the operating system, not not the African philosophy. This is an example of co-optation. And now what Google is doing is naming its undersea cable. Uh, Google's undersea cable around Africa is the longest, uh, no, the second longest. Face Facebook's is the longest and the second largest um, uh, undersea cable. And Google has, in the name of decolonization, Google has decided to call their, their undersea cable Olauda, uh, after Olauda Ikuano. Uh, Ikuano was uh, an African uh, slave that was uh, uh, that was forced into slavery that later became that later gained his own independence and became one of the most proponents of uh, slavery uh, abolishment and one of the most outspoken and monumental figure in in Africa. Uh, so unfortunately, um, naming the undersea cable, which unfortunately follows the exact slave uh, trade routes in uh, of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, I'll, I'll move to the, the next slide. As you can see here, uh, here is a comparison of the transatlantic slave uh, that that was established, you know, between, uh, you know, 1500s and 1900s for the slave trade. And uh, 
Google uses similar ports. For example, St. Helena was used as a port to, trans to transport slaves. Uh, uh, St. Helena was used as a port to, trans to transport slaves during uh, the transatlantic slavery era. And now uh, St. Helena is the main port for Google's undersea cables. So the project itself is very colonial, physically and ideologically. But the co-optation of, you know, abolitionist intellectuals such as uh, Olauda Equiano to name their undersea cable uh, is uh, for 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 the lack of uh, a better word. Um, uh, it's it's really problematic. I won't say about a bad word. Uh, so. <clears throat> um, now that we've looked at, uh, you know, what machine learning does, what 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 at the core of machine learning is, uh, and with a couple of examples of how machine learning research and the internet infrastructure uh, is uh, uh, are colonial projects, colonial or uh, uh, imperialist projects, uh, we will take a really brief look at the coloniality and then we will move on to comparing with uh, machine learning uh, and uh, things like you know machine learning and inter internet infrastructure are something that can be decolonized or not. So in our exploration of what's decoloniality, we uh, we kind of, laid the caveats that there is no single theory, there is no single approach, or there is no single practice of what decoloniality is. You look at theories, for, for, for example, you know, uh, within Africa uh, or uh, South America, you will find, you know, different objectives of coloniality, different practices and different theories. So that doesn't mean, you know, one of them is right and the rest are wrong. It just means that there are, you know, multiple theories, multiple approaches and multiple meanings to decoloniality, and that's okay. Uh, however, for our understanding and definition of decoloniality, we focus on Afrofeminism. More particularly, uh, we focus on the writings of feminist scholars across the African continent. Uh, more particularly on the writings of Wangari Matai and Sylvia Tamale. So <clears throat> decoloniality is about uh, getting at the, it's about um, undoing what has been, uh, undoing wrongs of the past and uh, colonialism war works by active erasure of hist historical, intellectual, and cultural contributions of indigenous communities. So the, at the center of uh, decoloniality, at least you know, the African feminists approach to decoloniality is you know, going back to the annals of history and bringing back or showcasing those intellectual contributions that have been actively erased by by uh, colonizers and uh, challenging Western narratives uh, of the decolonized decolonized communities and decolonized societies. Uh, because through erasing, through erasure, once you know those contributions have been erased, uh, it's it's easier for you know uh, Western colonizers to fill that gap with their own narrative of decolonized people. So decolonization is also about undoing that. Uh, another element of decoloniality is to kind of push away or move back from very individualistic Western rational and positivist science uh, that focuses, that's reductive and that focuses on individuals and to move towards uh, theories and approaches and practices that put relationality at the center, that put context and history and, and that see history as part and important element of the present. And this is really important because this point directly is, is in, in stark contrast with machine learning. As I said previously, uh, machine learning really is about making predictions, finding patterns with absolutely no understanding. On the other side, 
the coloniality at the heart of it really is about understanding. It's about in-depth understanding. It's about going back in history. It's about having a really, you know, clear, rigorous grasp of what we are looking at, um, as opposed to, you know, prediction, classification, or class clustering and abstraction. That, uh, which is what uh, what we do usually when we uh, are building machine learning models. And um, yeah, as I said, uh, the coloniality is going back in history and correcting, uh, you know, what has been uh, wronged by colonial powers, what has been manipulated and erased. Uh, the coloniality is also about, you know, looking at alternative futures. It's not only going back in uh, into history, but also looking forward uh, and, um, you know, uh, showcasing what has been done and what's being done and uh yeah it's also about you know mapping alternative futures and coming back to the question i looked at at the beginning of the slide uh, which is can machine learning be decolonized at all uh one of the driving uh um the driving thinking comes from, uh, you know, uh, Richard Lewinton, which is one of my favorite biologists of all the time, uh, where uh, he says in uh, Biology as Ideology, it's a great book, I highly recommend it, where the difference between defeatism and skepticism is that the former leads to passivity and the latter to action. So let me explain this a bit. So the idea behind this is that it's very easy to clearly see, you know, machine learning and the coloniality. If you think of a continuum, they stand at opposite side of each other. Because one is about, you know, communality, one is about caring about others, uh, one is about undoing past harm, uh, it's about uh, understanding, getting in depth understanding. Uh, it's about uh, really working towards, you know, the flourishing of communities on societies that have actively been harmed. The other, on the other hand, really is there is there is no care for understanding. It's about you know abstracting and making predictive models. It really is driven by you know, uh, capitalist motives, uh, it is very individualistic, and at the core of it is, uh, to, it's also um, uh, dominated and controlled by uh, homogeneous uh, groups, a few, a handful of homogeneous groups. So it's easy to see the these, these uh, stark differences and to conclude, no, that's impossible to, to have uh, a, a decolonial approach to machine learning. Uh, but that might be, uh, that's a totally fine position, uh, but also that can be a bit passive, uh, which means that you, you, you know, there is not much you can do, so uh, you, you dwell in the past. Uh, and to move away from that, what we did, this took a lot of reading, a lot of debating back and forth. What we decided is uh, it must be possible, even if it's not present now, to think about, uh, you know, to even imagine a, a version or a future where it's possible to think of uh, an, an emission learning model that can be decolonial. So these are the conditions we laid uh, in the paper that are really critical in, you know, in developing or to in order to claim that the such machine learning model can be decolonial. So some of the conditions are the the model must be built and controlled and owned by indigenous peoples that it's supposed to serve to begin with. Uh, and it has to serve the needs and interests and welfares of those people uh, in a manner that is informed and grounded by themselves, by their experiences, by their needs. And they have to be, of course, the you know uh, in control of the model. And they have to be the one that are deciding critical questions that are building the model itself. 
and um, it has to. There is so much uh, discussion, or, or or it has become you know common to think to talk about you know uh, general models or general AI or generalizable AI uh, that we think is uh, is something that has to go. Uh, because when we are often uh, catering for the general, uh, that means we are catering for the status quo. So the model has to be very specific, not general, uh, because general often serves the status quo and it becomes vacuous. That that really serves the status quo. So it has to be very specific as opposed to general. We also have to abandon the idea of models that serve all humanity. Again, that's uh, that's another way of building models that serve the status quo. So such model, if it has to be decolonial, has to serve very specific groups, concrete people, as opposed to abstract, you know, all humanity, all, all you know, all people. Um, other conditions for a model to be decolonial is that uh, it can't be, you know, somewhat neutral or or, or it, it it can't be somewhat neutral or take a bystander position. It has to, you know, from the get go, it must challenge, you know, racist, colonialist, eugenicist, patriarchal, white supremacist ideas. It has to be a model that is driven by these objectives. And it can it has to be completely divorced from ideas of eugenics and phrenology. Uh, this kind of makes a lot of the models that are kind of being put out in masses these days, you know, models that predict emotion, models that predict attractiveness, models that predict, you know, any, uh, any um, internal behavior based on external characteristics. All these have to go because they have roots and they adhere to ideologies of eugenics and, and phrenology and other racist white and white supremacist ideologists. Um, again, um, another condition is um, the model, the model we are building has to be constructive and, and restorative, and it has to be built on communal values. Um, that really put, you know, the, the the welfare of indigenous communities or marginalized communities at the center of it. And uh, and we look at uh, uh, Tahiku uh, Tahiku's project in um, indigenous communities in New Zealand, where uh, we taught they, the Maori uh, providers uh, serve as a really good example of how decolonial machine learning is possible. Uh, just to, to give you uh, a little bit more description. So Tahiku is an NLP project uh, that is um, that is designed, run, and managed and controlled by um, the Maori community in New Zealand. Uh, and the drive behind the objective comes from the need to, to revive uh, old language that's dying. Uh, during the British colonial era, era um, a lot of the, the Maori community were forced sometimes beaten up to when if they spoke their language. So the language it was uh, destroyed by colonialism. So the idea comes behind, the idea comes from this, this desire to restore the language that was destroyed by coloniality uh, or, or colonization. So they recorded, uh, you know, their elders, old, old people, uh, you know, doing various, uh, you know, passing various knowledges of the language and, and the culture and, and the history. And they collected for this particular project, they collected over 300 hours uh, in, of speech and text pairs. And they, the, so the data comes from them. They clean the data themselves. Uh, they annotated the data themselves. They build the data themselves. 
the evaluation was all done by themselves and um, they uh, had their own uh, data sovereignty principle, a legal principle that uh, makes sure that the data cannot be used by anyone else, that they have full control of the data. Uh, if it's, if someone wants to access to the data, they decide who can who can who the data can be shared with, for what purpose, for how long. So they do really have full ownership the, full ownership of the data, uh, and they have built you know um, speech to text technology. They have built um, speech recognition with eighty percent eighty six percent accuracy. So we thought, you know, what they are doing really satisfies, uh, you know, a, a, a decolonial machine learning. So, yeah, just to conclude on the on the bright side, uh, it's possible to have a decolonial um, uh, a decolonial approach to machine learning, and and the Maori are a good example. Uh, however, uh, uh, thinking about uh, a the colonial infra internet infrastructure is another issue. Uh, in in the paper that is forthcoming, we put you know various policy uh, uh, you know policy recommendations and demands. For example, uh, in, in order for the inf internet infrastructure to be decolonized, we need so many lifetimes to do so much of to undo so much of the harm that's being done. So much, so much of the monopoly and and you know Western control of the infrastructure. So much of the secrecy that's been happening. Uh, so that that is another issue. But um, uh, it's we have to envision, we have to imagine, you know, if internet infrastructure that is decolonized, even though it's very down in the line in the very long future, in the very far future. Uh, uh, it, it, we have to conclude with, you know, with optimism that that is possible. And I think I've been talking about for about 40, 45 minutes now. So I'll stop and we can move on to um, q and in, in discussions. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Berhani. And um, I want to welcome everyone to um, write questions in the Q&A box. Right now we have just someone who wrote a compliment and said that they're using your work as part of their master's work. So thank you, Megan, for that comment. But for folks, please feel welcomed to type your questions um, into the Q&A box and we will read them aloud. As we're waiting for folks to um, ask questions, um, I have a question to get us started. Oftentimes we hear the, that undoing some of the harms of machine learning, whether that is kind of machine learning perpetuating racism, machine learning perpetuating colonialism, and so forth. We oftentimes hear that the way to undo these harms is to get more data or better data. <laughs> um, but with decolonial machine learning, how can you speak a little bit to how data is sourced? Um, and how does the sourcing of data serve people that's meant to and center marginalized communities? Yeah, so on the one hand, uh, data is really important, whether we are building, you know, a mainstream machine learning model or a decolonial machine learning, uh, because without data, we can't really build any models. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we just need more data is also a very common narrative, a very common excuse you hear around, you know, the, you know, the mainstream machine learning community, whether it's to justify whether it's possible to build, you know, a, a phrenology model or not. You know, for example, uh, I strongly think that um, things such as you know predicting gender or predicting emotions or predicting any internal characteristics or internal behavior based on outer characteristics squarely fits into pseudoscience phrenology but some of the arguments has been that it's not we just need more data if we have more data we will build accurate models 
So people really bypassing the very idea that, you know, the whole idea of the whole conception of building a model that predicts emotion or gender is built on pseudoscience. So on the one hand, data is important, but on the other hand, it's very common to invoke the idea of we need more data to justify so many things. Coming back to how data can be important, you have various projects, for example, data for black lives. This is a, a community and a group played by Yeshima with Milner in the US, where they are using data to really shine light on injustices. For example, during COVID, we, we, we are still in, in COVID, but at the peak of COVID or at the start of COVID, uh, they used data to show that you know there is disparity in healthcare in 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 healthcare services there is disparity in you know the amount of the number of people that are dying from covid and of course you know uh, black and brown folks and marginalized folks uh, receive the least care the least healthcare so uh, so for example data for black lives has you know utilized data to really shine light on these issues. So yeah, so that's an example where data is really useful for the colonial projects. Amazing, thank you. Sydney, do you wanna read Sasha's questions? Uh, yeah, so uh, Sasha asks, I'm totally on board with all of these ideas, but how do we move the needle in terms of big tech controlling colonial AI models? Hi, Sasha. Uh, thank you for the great question. Uh, this is this is a question I've also been wondering about for the past, I don't know how many years. Uh, we, this is also a question that is slightly moving my research focus. Because before I was like the typical academic where I would just write academic papers, if it's data set audit, you know, we would do the, the uh, you know, the analysis, maybe run some experiments and publish like, oh, look, this is horrible. Uh, or look, here's a problem. And then maybe because it's academic tradition, you come up with various recommendations or methods to maybe improve the data set or something like that to move the needle just a little bit. But as time goes by, I'm finding myself focusing more and more on policy and regulation. So for example, the paper we just submitted on undersea cables in Africa ended up having a really heavy policy focus with you know, demands from big tech corporations and reg uh, uh, very actionable specific recommendations for policy makers across Africa. So what I'm what I'm trying to say, I guess, is me personally, I'm finding the way to move the needle is through policy and regulation, uh, not by, you know, if you look at any data sets, you, you will always find scandalous stuff and people will be shocked and there will be outrage after a few weeks, everybody moves on, nothing happens to the data set. Maybe very little happens to the data set and then you repeat the same pattern. So for me, I'm finding it's really important to, to look at, you know, to, to, to focus on, you know, regulations and policies in order to really bring about some actionable change. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Sasha, but this has been my approach. Thank you. The next question comes from Lorena or Lorena, who writes, thank you, Dr. Berhani. Any suggestions of volunteer organizations for systematically systemically excluded folks seeking to contribute their technical skills to community-based initiatives? Any specific communities, uh, volunteer organizations for systematically excluded for folks? Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, um, this is a really <laughs> interesting point. Uh, I don't know about volunteer organizations, but there are, I, I, it depends what a volunteer organization is. Uh, I'm not a big fan of volunteer organizations, for example, like NGOs or charities that 
are organized, you know, by people from the West that go into, for example, various parts of Africa to volunteer uh, for, you know, improving drinking water or health conditions or something like that. I think that kind of model is very questionable. Uh, and with uh, with a lot of the scandal unraveling around the effective altruist community, it has become clear that that model really that just doesn't work for 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 marginalized communities or for the people that it's supposed to help. If we are thinking of volunteer organizations in terms of organizations that are founded and run by, you know, indigenous communities or, uh, you know, various uh, indigenous groups themselves, uh, then, then that's a really great idea. For me, as long as, you know, any, uh, any organization or any project or uh, any kind of work, as long as it is driven by and as long as it's really directed, controlled by, you know, the communities that it's supposed to serve itself, then that's a good start then we can from the west go and volunteer that's or that's very that's a great contribution so in terms of those organizations i can't think of any off the top of my head at the moment uh we can if you want to follow up we can have more discussion i'm sure uh you know we can find a number of them um so there is one actually group that I know from that are working in Bamako in, in Mali. Um, what they are doing is uh, they are not a volunteer group, but they're they are a community where they are um, they are so you know central in west africa is a really has a really rich intellectual history in in mathematics in philosophy and they have for example in bamako they have so many manuscripts that have been passed down from you know hundreds of years ago these intellectual contributions so what this group is doing is do uh, doing um is it reservation or preservation sorry english is not my first language of those texts and usually these texts are you know taken over by western scholars and that that are you know transcribed or translated so they are doing that that job themselves they are keeping the manuscripts they are reviving them they are transcribing them so this is the kind of group that i think is amazing that could do with a lot of support from without interfering with, with what they are doing. Um, I hope that answers your question, but if you want to talk more and, and get uh, get a handle of a list of very specific groups, uh, there can be various connections that can be, that can be made across the, the African continent. And I, I, I know a lot of my knowledge because I'm, I'm from Ethiopia, I'm much more connected to uh, African indigenous thinking, African decoloniality, as opposed to other um, other strands of it. Sydney, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah, sorry, I was struggling to unmute. Um, so Tristan asks, thanks for well says, thanks for a very inspirational talk. Are there needs slash ways slash efforts to decolonize? Um, ML models aiming at predicting the progression of diseases such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's? Um, this is a very good, very specific question. I am not sure that I'm familiar, I am not sure of this, of such models. I'm not familiar with, you know, uh, efforts to build predicting mo predictive models of uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease from a decoloniality perspective. I'm not sure with, with that very specific uh, uh, specification, uh, but generally there is a call for decolonizing machine learning. Uh, with, as to you know, the specifics of decolonizing predictive models of Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, I'm, I don't know, I'm not familiar. I don't know any that I'm familiar with. Thank you. Um, and for folks, please feel welcome to continue to write in questions. 
We have someone who wrote more of a comment than a question, but I think we can kind of turn it also into a question. So this comes from Tracy, um, who's been alarmed by kind of solutionist attitudes um, adopted by people who are buying and employing AI in a variety of modalities, as well as those designing them. So Tracy gives the example of a recent story in a Montreal newspaper uh, regarding the use of Boston Dynamics robotic canine spot as a moving surveillance tool to mm. be used in our metro stations mm. um, as this way of identifying graffiti. Mm. Um, but the news items don't mention things about who's captured in this imaging. Mm. Um, so I guess to turn this comment a bit into a question, um, I'm wondering how you've approached how um, like ways that we can kind of shift conversations around deployment of AI machine learning technologies to kind of bring up these important topics of decoloniality, um, both in the conversations that we have with others, but also in terms of like how to react to these kind of like the way that the media tends to just have a really oversimplified narrative. Yeah, so the, I think a lot of the issue with the current state of AI and machine learning comes from uh, overestimating the, capabilities, the capacities of AI and just general overhype. It hides a lot of what's, what's actually possible, what's actually concrete, what's actually real, and what is really speculative or what is you know, merely just a concept or what actually, what are the models that are actually out there that are actually functioning, that are you know, working. So media, it's only actually not just media, you know, AI researchers, machine learning researchers themselves really sometimes get taken away by the overhype and they just lose, lose you know, uh, the ground. And, um, having said that, coming back to you know uh, the using the Boston Dynamics robots for surveillance is we actually delve into this in the in the um, in the weather, in the paper with Zirak Talat whether uh, machine learning is incompatible uh, with decoloniality or not. So one of the things we uh, we specify or we outline is. Um, Currently, you a lot of social applications. This is why it's important to 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 kind of taxonomize the the uh, you know the various models and applications of machine learning as like modeling very simple, for example, physical things, modeling somewhat you know, say for example, biological things compared to modeling social systems, such as you know who should be the who who is legitimate to receive you know social benefits or who should get a visa or who is hireable or things like that. All these are like, we are modeling very complex social elements. So when you look at a lot of models that have been put out, whether it's research or application, a lot of it focuses on, it's it's aimed at punishing people. It's aimed at, you know, catching people. For example, that Boston Dynamics robot, it's used as, you know, identifying people that, you know, that that might be misbehaving or that might, that might be drawing graffiti or something like that. So it comes from the desire to control and to punish people. So the colonial models have to move away from this kind of model of thinking, this kind of gacha model. It has to be about how do we help people? How do we... How do we, you know, rehabilitate people? Uh, it's not about uh, how do we predict whether someone will recommit crime or not. It's about if someone comes off a, when someone comes out of a prison, how do we rehabilitate them? How do we help them cope back in the in the social system? So you know, we have to have the objective has to be completely flipped from most of the current models of machine learning that we see around that 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 involve you know modeling the social system does that make sense thank okay. you um Sydney also if you have any questions too um please feel free to ask I have another question while we're waiting for some more from folks in the audience but did you have any Sydney but I'm not trying to put you on the spot 
<laughs> not off the top of my head, but I'm still, I'm processing everything as we go. So amazing. Um, so, um, at the start of your talk, you mentioned how often you're asked to just speak about the latest scandals in machine learning over and over, and it's kind of jumping from scandal to scandal. Mm. And you did talk about how now you're kind of orienting towards policy work, but because we see just scandals happening, and like you mentioned, there's momentary outrage, and then people move on. Um, how do you, like, what suggestions do you have for folks who are interested in kind of a sustained effort mm. about the challenges around machine learning? Um, yeah, so just to clarify, I'm not moving into policy space. I'm finding that space really challenging because uh, I really am an academic at heart. So I'm just finding a lot of my work incorporating policy work uh, as opposed to moving towards policy. Um, and in terms of how do we, sorry, could you repeat the question? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I was on meeting. Um, yeah. yeah um, so I'm wondering how you recommend folks to kind of lead to more sustained effort. Mm. So it's not that we're just one scandal and then another scandal, um, but how to kind of build in more of a sustainable effort against kind of the colonialism perpetuated mm. by machine learning and other harms of machine learning in addition. Mm, mm, mm. Um, you know, every effort, uh, in terms of, for example, uh, even say, say, for example, unionizing tech workers, uh, organizing, um, you know, various data workers, content moderators, data labelers, for example, organizing uh, can have all these little efforts can have huge impact. For example, yesterday, you no, know, two days ago. Uh, there has been ongoing back and forth case with Daniel Montang, a South African content moderator that was working for Sama, a Facebook contractor in 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 Nairobi, uh, and he brought um, he has been you know psychologically traumatized from content moderation and paid very little, and he was fired when he tried to organize when he tried to kind of uh, unionize. So. Uh, Foxglove, uh, a UK um, kind of data data lawyers uh, helped uh, and organized around that, and they brought both Sama and Facebook to court. And the Kenyan uh, uh, court ruled two days ago that yes, Facebook should be brought to court under the Kenyan ju ju juris juris jurisdiction. So the point I'm trying to make to say is, you know, things like that uh, make a difference, make a big change, amount to be a big uh, amount to something substantial, something sustained. Uh, we can also do technical work, for example, we, I, uh, I do audit work uh, with various collaborators. I see audit works themselves as a way of understanding issues, a way of understanding, a, a way of bringing forth things that need that need attention, things that need to be, uh, you know, that need to be improved. So you can have from tech organization to audit work to uh, a lot of legal and policy work. Uh, I also see that you know, these big giant organizations that are constantly striving to to earn, to bring in, you know, the highest revenue to gain the highest amount of the maximum amount of money, they really are not going to self-govern. They really are not going to, you know, um, self-regulate. So regulation, has, I see also regulation as a way of, you know, making sustainable change uh, in terms of, you know, a, a better and more just uh, futures. So there are so many various approaches, practices, ways. It can be academic, it can be activism, it can be community organization, it can be focusing on regulations and policy, uh, and all of it contributes um, to, uh, all amounts to something better. Thank you. I just want to give folks like another minute if they have any kind of final questions. Um, but if no other questions come in, 
Um, I also want to really thank you for this amazing presentation. And I was wondering if there was any kind of final word you wanted to leave folks with as we wrap up for today. I see a question from uh, Tracy. Oh, from Tracy, it's like a response of the comment. So oh, it's okay. speaking to the myth of objectivity mm -hmm. um, in AI. I mean, would you like to speak towards that? A bit more or there is a myth of objectivity of AI being used to promote AI. Yeah. <laughs> uh or dread consider have been made as well as which bodies are made uh the most feasible. Uh yeah, yeah. So you know the myth of objectivity and neutrality uh all fits into you know that Western narrative or illusion that you know uh, we can observe or model things from a view from nowhere. Uh, it's it's a total illusion, of course. There is you know uh, data always are collected with certain objectives, always come uh, from a view from somewhere. They always have context uh, and. Um, this myth of objectivity has, I think, maybe I'm just being op optimistic, which is very unlike me. Uh, I think this kind of thinking of, you know, models or data or science as purely objective has been constantly challenged and maybe slightly um, people are a bit more aware now. Again, this could be just my, my perception. Um, but yes, that myth of objectivity fits into the colonial narrative that I've been talking about where we can be rational uh, or objective and we can observe things from afar as if we have no personality, no interests, no objectives, you know, no, uh, uh, no history. Um, um, so that's really problematic. Uh, but this doesn't mean that everything is subjective. This doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, everything we see through our, you know, biased personal uh, viewpoints. It just means that we we acknowledge that, you know, any science we do, any questions we ask or any models we build are partially, you know, impacted or partially shaped and influenced by our own positionality. And admitting this is a much better scientific practice rather than falling for the myth of objectivity. And of course, the latter, which is that admitting all these, you know, all these contexts and histories and personal interests uh, fits much, it fits in much better. It, it fits in really well with the decolonial perspectives Whereas the the former, which is this the myth of objectivity, fits in with the with the colonial um, school of thought. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the other the other things. Thank you and Avox are people thanking you for your talk. Um, and I'm so grateful for you being here. Thank you to everyone who's attended. Thank you, Sydney, for working with the tech. Thank you, Sarah, for doing the captions. Also, since you had mentioned uh, Keone Mahalona's and Peter Lucas's Jones's uh, work on Tehuku Maori, I just wanted to point out for folks who are interested in learning more, they spoke back March 3rd, 2020 for this series and the video recordings available if you want to learn more about their work um, in uh, decolonial uh, language models and natural language processing. So thank you everyone so much for attending and we look forward to seeing you all at our future events this semester. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's thank been you. such a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great rest of your day. And Sydney, do you want to stop the recording? <laughs> awesome. Thanks. I. Oops. <laughs>